So we finally see a healthy rotation in high-end versus budget targeting between Intel and AMD, where the two companies are switching their positions now at least every couple cycles. This is a good thing to see, and it's really become apparent just in the past week the extremes to which the price reductions are happening now because the prices for Intel's brand new 11700K have already been slashed. The thing's barely been available, officially anyway, uh, for a week at this point. So we're in a crazy situation. The 3600, you might remember, was available at one point for $160, which was obscene, but uh, it was available for $180 and even $200 for an extremely long time. The R72700, about $200 for a long time. But now we're in a position where Intel is getting in on the action too and realizing that actually it is better to sell old product rather than try and maintain some appearance of quality by forcing a high price and going for the perceived value or the perceived quality by nature of price strategy that Intel's gone for over the last few years. That's what we're talking about today, the paradigm shift for Intel and why Intel's old CPUs have suddenly become relevant and actually worth considering at this point. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So as for what forced Intel's paradigm shift, it's the 11 series. Intel launched a new product, and for once, the older product actually dropped in a, a large and significant way. Intel's been slowly shifting this direction. The 9900K, for example, is a, a, an older CPU that we overlooked back in November and December, when it was already pretty old at that point, as being a good budget option because the prices were slashed. But this is uncommon. It wasn't really until the 9900K and to some extent the 8700K that we started seeing meaningful uh, price reductions that were still relevant in terms of timeliness, meaning it's not like it was several years later. It was pretty instant with a new generation launch from Intel or from a competing launch from AMD. So this has been rare up until just the last year or so. And, and even uh, now it's, I mean, <laughs> this is extreme. So specifically, launching a new product and then reducing its price basically within a week. That's absurd. And that's what happened with the 11 series. The 11700K, waste of sand that it is, is now cheaper than it was when it launched. And by the way, it launched about a week ago. So that's where this topic came from. And as we started looking around, we noticed that the 10700, as many of you pointed out in the comments, is also absurdly cheap at this point. The 10700K has been knocked down, the 10900K has been knocked down in price to the extent that Intel's best CPUs right now are its old ones. As for why the prices have dropped already for the 11 series, well, it's kind of a sunk cost fallacy. It's, it's a perfect example of the sunk cost fallacy where uh, Intel spent a lot of time making this particular mistake and now it is clinging to that mistake to see it through. Because it's put in this much time to get here, damn it, it's going to finish it. Even if it wasn't really the right move, holy, we, we still think they should have probably just refreshed and rebranded the older parts, but uh, that's not what happened, so it doesn't matter. There's one major positive of the 11 series though, aside from the 11400, which is actually worth looking at, it's a pretty good CPU, but it's the price cuts of the last remaining 10 series CPUs. Those cuts won't last forever, but they're here for now. And we'll walk through them in this piece and provide some historical pricing data to sort of prove the point. But for a quick preview of what we're going to talk about, the i9-10900K is now about $460, down from over 500 originally. All these prices are at time of writing, obviously, though we'll have only a couple day turnaround on this. The i9-10900 non-K is $360, which is an excellent deal for 10 cores and beaten only by the previous $400 pricing of the 3900X. 
the i7-10700K is now $310, which is already $10 less than when this piece started. It was $320 at that point. And that's down from over $400. The 10700KF, without any IGP, that's what the F means, is $296, down $4 since the start of this piece. These are actually worth considering at this point, and we'll show a few benchmarks to highlight that. The non-K CPUs are especially interesting since they often run close to the K-SKU in stock spec and are now marked down by upwards of $100. The 11700K itself is already down to $420 at this point. Suitable, because you'd need, you'd need to be... Let's move on. Historically, Intel CPUs have remained largely fixed in price over time, which is something we can prove with historical data, by the way, and we'll look at in this video. This is a company that produces millions of CPUs to the extent that they end up flooding markets in other countries as the parts age and struggle to sell firsthand in the US or Europe. We've seen this firsthand ourselves too when visiting markets like Hua Chian Bay SEGE Market or Guanghua Shuwei Xintian Di in Taiwan. The shops we've seen here were a mix of secondhand and brand new. That included still sealed and in box with the original quintessentially Intel pasted coolers. Very identifiable. You know when it's new in box and when it hasn't been messed with. These markets were where, if you knew the right places, you could get those older Intel CPUs for cheap. AliExpress was another option. It's a bit of a gamble. It's typically more expensive than in person and on the ground. But you could get these CPUs eventually at a lower price when they were much older in secondhand markets or resellers of old new stock, so to speak. On sites in the West, the prices didn't age so well for Intel CPUs. As the company launched successive replacements, and even as AMD began competing competently, Intel's hubris had it clinging to a mentality of, we can sell anything we make, even as that was slipping. You saw this with the 6700K, the 7700K, and to some extent the 8700K, but that's where Intel started changing its paradigms and moving towards a more competitive model as AMD made it clear that this Ryzen thing wasn't a bad idea. We'll quickly talk about the value proposition of Intel's price drops. The i9-10900K is an unlocked part that can overclock, which has it at $460 as opposed to, say, $360 for the locked version of the 10-core CPU. At $460, this is one of the cheapest entries to a high-core count CPU that has some basic production capabilities, but it's still a gaming powerhouse. Let's look at some charts as an example. In Rainbow Six Siege, thanks to the 11900K's anemic performance, the 10900K ended up leading the charts by a sort of wide margin of 24 FPS average here. More importantly, its closest competitors are the R9-5900X and R9-5950X, neither of which was readily available at the time of writing, and both of which have tended to be more expensive, especially the 5950X, which is actually just more expensive. Even when those parts are available, the 5900X is over $500 if sold around or at MSRP, which has the 10900K now cheaper, and in some of the gaming scenarios we'll look at, better. Although the 5900X is advantaged in production work, which you'll see later. It's not a blowout for the 10900K, of course. Highlight now the 5800X in Red Dead 2, which is about $450 at the time of writing, and roughly the same price as the 10900K at the time of writing, and we see a wide gulf of 7% favoring the 10900K. That's not too much in the scope of just this game, but the 10900K is cheaper, and the extra two cores have other advantages. Now, of course, it's not one-to-one -one core comparison between two architectures across brand, but there's some value to it. For instance, the 10900K outdoes the 5800X in our code compile testing by another 7% reduction in time required, and it's about equal to the 5800X in CPU cycles rendering in Blender when using the tile-based renderer cycle that's built in. The 10900K doesn't always win gaming. F1 2020 at 1080p has the 5800X advantaged by 5.8%, and GTA 5 has the 10900K at 130 FPS average to the 5800X's 139 FPS average. So it still depends on the game. Hitman 3 is another instance where the 10900K is actually slightly ahead of the 5800X. Ultimately, though, the 10900K trades with the 5800X, and its pricing is in the range of 460 now, which makes it much more defensible than the 500 plus joke of a price that it had before. Of course, if you can intercept the 5900X at $500, that'd be one of the best possible deals at the true high end if you can stretch another 40 bucks out of your budget past what the 10900K costs. The 5900X does remain one of the best CPUs available right now, and it's one of the most versatile between 
some level of pseudo-professional production type workloads and gaming or hobbyist workloads. We would be completely happy with the 5900X and one of our rendering machines, for example, and we'd be using it professionally to make money with. So it gives you an idea of where the 5900X lands, but it does, of course, have to be actually available to make that argument, and it needs to be closer to $500. In terms of downsides, the 10900K doesn't have an upgrade path, while the 5800X technically has an in-socket upgrade path in the 5900X or 5950X, should you come across used options of those in a few years' time. That is, assuming the used market isn't completely ridiculous. The 11900K doesn't really count as an upgrade path for the 10900K because you'd be worse off in many applications. It's, it's a thousand numbers higher. It's, it's 11,900 instead of 10,900, but it's not an upgrade. The 5800X to the 5900X upgrade is a fairly rare scenario that we foresee happening. Uh, it'd be similar to going from a 4690K to a 4790K. Certainly people have done that. We have people on staff who have done that. But you're ultimately going to be stranded on the platform after the 5000 series. So the weight of an upgrade option isn't as strong here as it is in some of the previous comparisons. As such, the 10900K makes a lot of sense in a gaming-focused build, and it's still competent in production. But it's not as clear of a victory for Intel against nearby AMD as some of the lower-end options where AMD isn't competing that hard. The 10 cores aren't as good as AMD's 8 cores in a lot of these production tasks, like compression or decompression, in addition to the aforementioned Blender benchmarks. But it's competing mostly one for one, and it holds a few key advantages in gaming and an overclocking headroom. We didn't show the OC results for this round of testing, but you've probably seen it in our previous reviews, and if you haven't, they're obviously still online. The 10900K has room to scale as it ages, which is the value of that letter K. And then there's the 10900 non-K, which might be an interesting option. It's locked, but you still get 10 cores, 20 threads, and a more insane price of 360 ish dollars. That's possibly a better buy than the 10700K at its new $310 to $20 price, depending on when you check, and we'll discuss that one in a moment. Comparing the 10900 to the 10900K, other than the locked nature of the 10900, the primary difference is core clock. The 10900 runs about 100 megahertz slower in max turbo frequency, and it lacks thermal velocity boost, or TVB, which is a, a dumb toggle for 100 megahertz boost when under 70C. Dumb toggle being in more of the electrical engineering sense. 100 megahertz isn't a big hit for $100, so it's a good positioning compared to where it used to be. The base frequency also falls, of course, but as far as gaming is concerned, it's those boost numbers that are the most interesting to us. You can always force it to stay in boost at all times too, even if it's a locked CPU. We don't test that way, but it is a setting that's made available as a pseudo overclock of a non-K CPU. It locked the multiplier to max, so 52, but you could still apply it across all cores at all times, assuming the cooling and power are sufficient, and of course that the motherboard gives you those options, but most do. If you're not concerned about overclocking, the 10900 non-K is one of the best deals right now, but the 10700 series is probably more worth looking at, since they keep dropping the price as we're writing this script. So then on to the 107 series. The Intel 10700K bombed in our original review. It I think we called it dead on arrival, or something very close to that. It was sold for around $400, and like the AMD 5800X, it seems like a relatively small subsection of the audience should intentionally go for a 10700K versus a neighboring 10600K at launch, or an AMD 5900X if you wanted something better. Besides, at the time, a 3900X could still be had reasonably for around the same exact price, about 400 bucks, and that offered superior production capabilities while the 10600K offered basically equivalent gaming capabilities to the 10700K. The extra two cores did almost nothing for the 107K, and overclocking a 106K could get you past the baseline performance of a 107K anyway. Now, at a new price of 320 at the time we originally wrote this, but 310 before recording it, the 10700K makes a lot more sense. It's now competing closer in price with the R5 5600X, our 2020 go-to all-around CPU and it's better positioned than the 11700K while providing similar performance. It's nearly identical. In Hitman 3, the 10700K ran at 133 FPS average, outdoing the $270 11600K. The 10700K also aligns roughly with 5600X performance in Hitman 3, but runs cheaper than we can currently find a 5600X on Amazon or Newegg at time of writing, and we don't care about your micro center pricing. Sorry to say it's not near us or 99% of the audience besides 
you also have to consider the microcenter pricing for Intel to make it fair. So we're just factoring in what we can see on Amazon and Newegg and BNH Photo right now. In Red Dead 2, the 10700K is doing about 167 FPS average, but it maintains better lows in this game than the 5600X. That is sort of a special Red Dead feature for Intel though. It's also cheaper than the 5800X or the 5600X current pricing. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p allows the 10700K a run that's not too distant from the 5600X, although the 5600X does lead here. Once switching over to 1440p and a GPU bind though, the Intel CPUs benefit in this specific game from the driver combination with Nvidia to lead the chart. Again, not always the case. There's a lot of caveats in all these charts, but that's why we look at multiple of them. Production performance for the 107K is middling at best, and we wouldn't buy the 10700K for production-focused builds. So if that's your goal, probably skip this one. It's okay when gaming-focused, and it's not bad at production, but everything else nearby in price is better. AMD has better options here, and it has for a few years now. Of course, there's the 10700 non-K at $300, it's actually about 2, 296 now. Uh, the price reduction though isn't as good as the 10900K and the non-K price drop of $100 to the 10900K is much more desirable than what we're seeing here. It's worth paying attention to though for those who won't ever overclock if you know that's going to be the case. We worked with PC Part Picker to get some sales data from the last few years on various AMD and Intel CPUs and we'll share all that in depth in an upcoming video but for now we just wanted to prove a point that it is in fact uncommon for Intel to drop the prices. So this will sort of reinforce what we're saying as being significant that Intel's really pulling things down so early. There was a bizarrely highly upvoted comment we saw on Reddit claiming that uh, Intel normally drops its prices, but the reality does not reflect this claim. The 10 series and the 9900K to some extent are special exceptions and they mark a positive shift. This is a good thing in the pricing behavior of Intel's old inventory. This data is from PC Part Picker's price crawler. If you check the PCPartPicker.com website, you'll see that they have some publicly available historical pricing data that you can see as a user. We emailed them directly though and asked for a little bit extra and were able to put together this chart and some other charts we'll publish in a future piece. On the PC Part Picker website, you'll see that the aggregate price data shows multiple retailers and uh, what we're gonna be looking at in our chart is the combined average pricing for the retailers who permit PC Part Picker to retain data long term. For instance, the 7700K launched at around $330 to $360 and remained almost exactly that price for its entire lifespan. Even now, it's around $330 on the few places that still have it. The 7600K followed the same behavior. It never fell in price for more than a blip of a sale and it stayed at $240 for the majority of its life, eventually getting more expensive than MSRP. The 8600K did much the same. It launched around $270 and it got scalped for a little while. Then it settled and stayed largely flat for years with a few occasional spikes. The 8700K moved a lot more and was the beginning of what Intel's doing now, but to less of an extreme than we're seeing with the 11 series' immediate price drops and the 10 series' large price drops. This is a good direction from Intel, whether or not Intel decided to do it, uh, and it's best for consumers and for making use out of old inventory. There's no point to having it sit on shelves and in warehouses until it's thrown out. Best get it moved sooner in uh, its lifespan than later so that it's still useful to somebody. And we'll explore this side of AMD separately, but AMD has taken the opposite approach as it's had to compete more fiercely and has dropped its prices very quickly. And it seems like they flipped. That's what Intel is doing today with the 10 and the 11 series. Now, to be really clear, we're not saying that Intel CPUs with these price reductions have become the best option. They are far better options than they once were. And in some cases, they've become the best option for the specific scenarios in which they are performing the best for the best price. So the 10700K is sort of remarkably well positioned compared to its launch especially but especially compared to the 11 series, which is set expectations. So 10700K is definitely worth looking into further. Uh, all of our data from the original review is still accurate. It's just that our positioning is different now because we were basing our opinion of it based on the price at the time. But if you just need data, then you can check the original review to get an idea of where things land, the power consumption, thermals, the overclocking performance. It's all about the same as it was. It's just our opinion has changed since now the price has changed to be much more positive than it once was. The 10900 non-K 
non-F is also reasonably well positioned. It's pretty cheap, 10 core option. Can't cut much cheaper than that in terms of core count until you start buying used Xeons or new old Xeons or things of that nature. So that's worth looking at, 10900K if you're inter interested in overclocking, but that's where it gets a little fuzzier for Intel and some matchups because the 5800X is a pretty close competitor with it. Not our favorite CPU because we really liked where the 5600X aligned and it basically matched the 5800X in gaming performance. That's all you care about. You should be looking closer to the $300 mark for your CPU options. So like 260 to 300 bucks will get you a good gaming only CPU that'll last a long time. But once you're looking at production stuff, the 5800X and the 10900K, uh, the 5800X's cores, even though it's fewer, tend to carry it a bit better in a lot of those production applications, sans a few of them that we've pointed out in the benchmarks in the past. Regardless, now with these prices, Intel CPUs land where they really should have been landing. This was an excellent opportunity for Intel to pull an NVIDIA or an AMD, and in between cycles when it doesn't really have anything that interesting, launch a refresh of something old. They've already got the crazy naming. Why not tack another 50 to the end of it? And do some bolstered skew at a cheaper price. Uh, either way, this is effectively what we've gotten. The 11 series did have to get sacrificed for it, but that's the nature of it. The 11900, the 11700K CPUs, the price position is just not good right now. So Intel has become the new AMD. And when we say that, we strictly mean in, in the sense of the brand marketing or positioning where AMD was the budget brand. It was the thing that you buy for cheap production builds. And in the 2000 and definitely the 3000 series, it started to become the thing you buy for cheap gaming builds. As the i5 was losing ground, it was becoming antiquated and was stuck in four core ways, four core, four thread, uh, until Intel eventually changed it to even the i3s having hyper threading. So Intel is now forced into a position where it sort of has to acknowledge and accept that it's becoming a more budget conscious choice. And that's not a bad thing. But because Intel, one, is so focused on ASP, uh, average selling price, and two, is so used to being perceived as the best because it's got more money than AMD, it seems like it's been hard for Intel to just get past that sort of hubris and sell the products in a way that will sell, that in fact will move units. And this uh, trend that we've seen over the past week is that way. So Intel's awakening to it. And AMD has sort of lost its ways a little bit from the past several years because it's realized that it doesn't have to compete at $200 anymore because it's selling every single 5600, 5800, 5900X that it makes. And that's okay. As long as the two companies are flip-flopping like that with some regularity, the industry's healthy. It's okay for one of them to think that it's superior to budget class options as long as the other one is filling that role. The problem we face is when they both start to ignore certain markets because they both realize that they can sell everything they make, but we're not there yet. So this is a good thing to see overall. Hopefully that highlights the interesting positioning of Intel's 10 series worth looking at, even if it seems old. Remember that's basically the 11 series and a lot of performance uh, benchmarks were very close to it, except now cheaper. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us out directly. And I'll see you all next time.